Well, our speaker tonight is Tim Beatley, who is a longtime member of our community and the faculty at UVA. Uh, today, Tim is, I've got it written down, the Teresa Heinz Professor of Sustainable Communities at the School of Architecture at UVA. And for decades, Tim has done really groundbreaking work linking community planning with both the appreciation and conservation of nature. Uh, Tim has written many books. Here's one from my bookshelf, uh, Habitat Conservation Planning. Oh, that's an old one. Tom. He's in urban growth. That's, I was going to say that's an early <laughs> one, 1994, yeah. an early one in a right. long parade of books by Tim. More recently, Tim has written uh, a book titled Biophilic Cities. And with all of the concern over tree losses in Charlottesville and wondering how on earth can we preserve uh, trees and other natural life forms in Charlottesville. We're delighted to have Tim join us tonight to talk about can Charlottesville become a biophilic city. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tim. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, find the slides. And so I should probably just tell you that I've in case it looks like I'm about to collapse or something, I, I, I started this morning with a with a um, podcast at 9 a.m. and it's been sort of nonstop. Um, <clears throat> and I environmental sciences guest lecture just a couple hours ago, so I'm <laughs> um, I'll <clears throat> I'll just kind of uh, muster my energy and ho hope hope I won't I don't collapse, but. Uh, Thank you so much for inviting me. It's it's always fun to to do this. And Tom, you had mentioned I think that um, it would be great to talk about biophilic cities. Um, and but then also if you just said or um, you know the idea of trees and tree tree protection and and urban forest kinds of things. So I, I I'm going to try to blend those things together and start with with biophilic cities. And um, so can everybody see the screen at this point? Yay. Okay, great. Well, just interrupt me at any point if things aren't advancing. Um, so, Tom, the answer to your question about can, can uh, Charlottesville be a biophilic city? I mean, there are several ways, of course, of answering that. And one is that we would would love to have Charlottesville in, in this network. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. There's a, a process for joining. We've, we've had discussions with various people in the city uh, we have um, several several Virginia uh, cities that are are now uh, partner cities in the network, uh, including Arlington, uh, Richmond, and Norfolk. So it would be lovely to have Charlottesville in the network. Uh, but I obviously you're you're meaning this question um, in a little bit of a different way, less mechanical, and and more in terms of what a what a biophilic city is. So. So for us, just to begin um, with the basics of the word, uh, obviously, bio, the concept of biophilia is very uh, central to what we are doing with this network. I, I have to give a lot of credit to uh, E.O. Wilson, Harvard uh, biologist, who he wasn't the first person to use the word biophilia, but he's really the one who's used it, coined it in the way that we think of it today, this idea that we're hard hardwired uh, to need and want uh, that connection with the natural world. I mean, literal meaning, of course, a love of of life and living systems, um, and the you know notion that we've co-evolved with with nature, and uh, that's at the heart of this uh, idea that we uh, nature is not something optional. It's uh, absolutely essential to leading a uh, happy, healthy, meaningful life. It has to be uh, all around us uh, all the time. It can't just be something that we we get uh, once or twice a year on a on a vacation or a, ho a holiday. So that's the challenge. Um, the the premise that nature again we we need it. It has to be around us. Uh, we have co-evolved with nature, um, and it does so many things uh, for us. Again, we want we want to be immersed in that nature. It's not something uh, some distant thing that we visit. It is the the place that we live, essentially. So here's one definition from uh, from E.O. Wilson. And for me, it's, I think, pretty intuitive for a lot of us that when we think about the things in the world that give us uh, pleasure and delight and and that are meaningful to us, they, a, a lot of them, at least for me, uh, can have to do with the natural world. When I 
think about uh, trees and flowers and and butterflies and 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 birds. Um, I've been thinking a lot of lately and writing a lot lately about the idea of a bird bird friendly cities, and I, I've got a couple of slides about that later. But there uh, is something about uh, seeing a bird, hearing a bird, um, and and all, all the other things on this on this image that that deliver so much uh, meaning and value um, uh, for a lot of us. So there's a lot of evidence and a lot of research, and it's growing almost weekly. Uh, we could spend the whole time tonight talking about that. Uh, just a, a little bit of um, a little sampling of, of some of that evidence is a, a, a study in bioscience not that long ago, uh, looking at the relationship between the greenness of, a, of, of neighborhoods and uh, reports of of depression, anxiety, and stress. The the greener the the neighborhood, the uh, the more trees, the more birdsong, uh, the lower the levels of reported depression, anxiety, and stress. Not not maybe not surprising. Um, a walk in the woods. Um, we know from a lot of evidence coming out of Japan over a long period of time, this idea of forest bathing. They've discovered that at the end of that <clears throat> walk in a forest, um, th that our stress hormone levels go down, that we get uh, a clear uh, boost to our immune system. And in fact, the inhaling of those uh, phytoncides, uh, those aerosols that are uh, generated not just by um, evergreen trees, but also by oak trees, other other kinds of trees that they help us. Um, they, they, in fact, uh, help to control um, cancer. Their um, cancer anti-cancer, you know, qualities or uh, powers to to uh, those aerosols. And we have a lot of really interesting new new ways for kind of understanding uh, what the, the power of nature is. This is one example of a, a study from last spring <clears throat> actually published uh, a, a study actually of uh, from Brussels uh, in Belgium, looking at the, the relationship between the size of trees, the size of, of the canopies of trees and the, and sales of mood disorder medications and also cardiovascular uh, disease uh, medications and finding not again not surprisingly that where a neighborhood in neighborhoods where the trees are larger the crowns are larger there are more trees the sales are lower of these things so I'm I'm often pointing recently pointing to this study in part because it it's part of a growing recognition of, about the the power and value of large trees. And protecting those existing larger trees, which is the first thing that we need to do in our uh, efforts to make cities biophilic and to and to make them um, and to expand their the tree uh, uh, canopy and protect them. We've got to protect the the trees that we have, and the mental health benefits um, are just immense. So there is a bit of a science of biophilia. We're not entirely sure what's going on and why it is that we are so drawn uh, to nature and so uh, uh, powerfully affected by the nature uh, around us. Um, there is a lot of uh, thinking and writing about fractals, of course, and fractals are those self-repeating shapes in nature. The tree that you see here, the um, that leaf is a small version of the bow, which is smaller, small version of the larger tree. A, a lot of nature uh, is heavy in fractals, and um, we've gotten to know Richard Taylor. Is a quote quote here from from him. He's the uh, uh, chair of the physics department at the University of Oregon, and he's kind of coined this these terms fractal fluency. And he uh, makes a pretty strong case that we have, as a species, evolved a visual system really that is meant to is able to effortlessly process that those fractal shapes um, and so not surprising that we are relaxed and calm and um, stress reduced when we are are looking at trees or watching clouds or uh, watching water or listening to water those things that have have uh, high fractal um, uh, densities so if you had to summarize <clears throat> a lot of this uh, evidence it's, it's very hard uh, first of all and this is a sl slide that I, I tried to put together for a, a healthcare conference um, a couple of years ago, in fact, in, in Oregon. 
and and uh, it's hard to, to to the literature is growing very quickly, and the evidence again is 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 mounting. I think, but all the things on the right side of the screen are things that we that we see uh, in response or in the presence of nature. So I, I mentioned lower depression, lower anxiety, uh, stress reducing benefits of nature, improved mood. Um, a lot of uh, evidence about physical activity, the, the greener, the more natureful a neighborhood is, the more trees there are, the more likely we are to be outside walking uh, and engaged in physical activity, which in turn uh, has uh, positive health benefits, <clears throat> even evidence about crime and gun violence, uh, study uh, studies in, uh, in, uh, um, from the University of Pennsylvania that show that um compared to to vacant lots where you uh, don't have a uh, tree planting or greening when you when you do plant those trees uh gun violence goes down um but a, a lot of very interesting things and 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 evidence coming out of a lot of different places uh including economics even uh, but but public health and, and environmental psychology especially some of the evidence I think is pretty interesting in, in showing how uh, in the presence of nature, we are likely to be better human beings. Uh, so we have evidence that uh, with more nature around us, uh, we are we are more generous, we are more cooperative, we're more likely to be thinking long term. And uh, so I think that's that one interesting um, inclusion is that if if we if we want to build um, com compassionate, uh, ethical cities, um, more nature will help us to do that. If I'm frequently summarizing a lot of this with the word flourishing, I, mean, I like the word flourishing a lot. It it captures not just the the pleasure, the delight, but it also um, captures the sort of deeper meaning and and purpose that we get from that connection with nature and the deep connections to place and deep connections to each other uh, through nature. It is uh, <clears throat> definitely true that we uh, are faced with uh, some challenges and uh, um, largely in response to climate change, but not entirely. But So we're often talking about the resilience of cities, the need to build that resilience. And, and I think it's uh, fair to say that it, just about anything that you can do to make a city more natureful will make it more resilient. Th these are images from <clears throat> Rotterdam, where... Uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands, where they are, of course, confronting a whole uh, ho host of wa water-related uh, challenges, water fl flood management, uh, river water, but sea level rise from the North Sea, uh, rainwater, and all the things you see on, on the screen here are things that, that, that um, address those water hazards, but also uh, help to bring more nature into the city. So they've been uh, subsidizing uh, the the installation of green roofs in that city, uh, uh, partly to to manage the water, but also again to bring more nature in, into the city. The image uh, second from the left is a very interesting idea of, of of a water plaza or a water square. These are these are new uh, small parks and gathering spaces uh, in neighborhoods that need them. Uh, with with quite a bit of nature, but they are also designed to retain stormwater. Um, so they're doing multiple things at, at once. Um, it's a really interesting time to talk about biophilic cities and, and, and uh, kind of imagining or reimagining our future. As we're transitioning out of the pandemic, a lot of us don't really want to go back to that cubicle work environment, right? I mean, this is really interesting. I uh, was just talking today about with someone about a Amazon. <clears throat> You've probably been watching. Amazon has now mandated that their employees come back to work um, for a minimum of three days a week. They, they can't even seem to get employees to come back for that time frame. That, nevertheless, uh, five days a week. So many of us just don't want to be in the office any, any longer. And we'd rather be uh, out out in a park uh, or working in a in a forest. So we've um, gotten to know this group called Nature Desks. Um, they're based in the Netherlands, and they have started something called the International Outdoor Office Day. Um, and uh, so, helping to kind of uh, provoke some discussion about how work work will be changing. So many things in in cities, I think, will, will be changing. 
Um, and it is true that in, in many cities, office occupancy rates are, you know, 50 percent um, in some places. That's pretty, pretty shocking. Lots of opportunities maybe to convert those spaces to something else. But I think it's indicative, again, of how, how much we'd rather be sitting in the image in the place that person is sitting in. So there has uh, been this, this real, uh, really a revolution around uh, design. Uh, and the and the recognition of the of the power and the importance of incorporating nature into everything that we design. Uh, I'm m more often talking about biophilic cities, thinking about nature at the scale of that city. But um, it is true that a biophilic building, a biophilic city, is a city that is full of biophilic buildings. So everything that we design, every structure that we build, uh, could be profoundly more biophilic. So just a few images to um, kind of reinforce that point. This is actually a cancer center in Toronto that uh, is quite, quite wonderful. We've gotten to know Ty Farrow, who's, a, who's the architect, and you see the living, the actual living trees, but it's also uh, structural uh, wood uh, that is is taking, creating the shape and form and feeling actually of, of a forest as you walk into this uh, lobby. So um, biophilic design, when we when we use those words, t tends to be tends to have a focus on buildings. Um, but all the things here uh, could be applied at a city scale as well. This is Steve, Stephen Kellert, who a longtime faculty member, a professor at the Yale School of Forestry, passed away now. But he did a lot of the early writing around biophilic uh, design, <clears throat> created this framework of elements and attributes. I won't go through all of this, but I've highlighted a few things that are maybe important to 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 bring attention to. Uh, definitely, we're talking about environmental features uh, like air, water, you know, plants and animals, but it's uh, biophilic design also recognizes the the benefit, the value of shapes and forms from nature and and um, uh, built building materials that are more biophilic, like wood and stone. Um, back to the fractals again. Um, it's designing things with lots of natural light. Um, and it's also uh, thinking about place and connections to place. Um, and things at the at the, the last column here involved human relationships. I'll just pull out two, two things that are uh, quite important. One is prospect and refuge. This is um, commonly discussed in the biophilic design world, the idea that we have, we've co-evolved We've we've evolved in an, in the natural world to to really prefer uh, prospect, which are these kind of wide perspectives, being able to see things coming from far away. Why why is it that we love to see things at sort of a landscape scale? What is it about a, a coastline that we 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 really enjoy seeing? It's that wide view, that wide expansive view, the prospect, and the the theory is that we. Uh, we have evolved uh, that th this is, helps deliver, you know, some some of our evolutionary success if we're able to see our enemies coming um, from far away. On the other end, refuge. Um, how is it? Why is it we're so comfortable in certain spaces? Um, I go into a, a cafe or, or a restaurant and, and I don't sit in the middle. I usually feel most comfortable sitting with the ball with a wall behind me or in the corner. We, we seek um, safety. We see, seek refuge as well. And many things in 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 the natural world um, that combine this the, these prospect and refuge. And the last thing, maybe awe. I'll circle back to this maybe in a, in a little bit. But there is a a lot of new work around uh, the the experience of awe, the sensation or the um, feeling of awe that we get, not just from nature, lots of other things, but the the sense of vastness about the natural world and it can be by looking up at the at, at the uh, dark sky at the at the stars above uh or it might be looking uh watching an ant uh, walking along the sidewalk or or and and i'm i'm frequently finding myself describing a biophilic city as a city that works to maximize moments of awe and i'll give you some examples of that in just a little bit so at the building scale lots of really wonderful uh, projects. Um, many of you know probably about Bosco Verticale in Milan, the, the twin forested towers, a lot of incorporation of natural features into buildings now. Um, this is a new project in Toronto, our partner city Toronto, 
uh, several hundred trees that uh, are actually uh, growing in in spaces and in, in the growing growing spaces actually uh, designed into the floor plate of the of the building. Um, wonderful example of the uh, Center for Sustainable Landscapes at the Phipps Conservatory in uh, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is one of our partner cities in the network. And actually, the Phipps Conservatory has been a wonderful collaborator and, and partner. And um, I, if I forget to say this or em emphasize this, we, we, we make one of the things we do is try to capture these stories by making short documentary films about uh, buildings, projects, initiatives, and cities. And so um, on, a, on a few slides, you'll see, watch the film. Well, all, all these are all films that you can find on the film page of our Biophilic Cities um, uh, page, our, our website, biophiliccities.org. Love for you all to go and see what's there. So there's a, a seven, seven or eight minute documentary film about this Center for Sustainable Landscapes. You can get a little sense of what this building is about. You see the wonderful uh, public green roof on top here. These are uh, workspaces that have views of nature, windows that open uh, a lot of living nature around, a lot of use of uh, native plants uh, throughout the, the, the project and throughout the building. Um, so um, very uh, important that we think about the, the design of buildings, uh, definitely. But it's more than that. Our vision of biophilic cities is, again, a vision that includes um, many biophilic buildings, but it's much beyond that. It's thinking you know, about all the spaces of that city, uh, the, the spaces between and beyond the buildings, the, the really at all the scales of a city. So it's room or rooftop to a region or bioregion and all, all of those scales in between and ideally connected and integrated. So uh, biophilic cities are cities that connect us to nature, definitely. Um, they are nature, they are cities that uh, um, emphasize uh, connect nature connections, but also nature conservation. Um, I'll give you some examples in a, in a, in a minute, but uh, one of the things that we, we are worried about, Tom, you mentioned bi biodiversity, uh, conservation. We are in in the midst of of a global extinction crisis, and cities uh, will not be the the primary answer, but they have to be part of the the answer. And so, our vision of biophilic cities is is very much one of of multi species cities, cities in which we actively uh, make room for uh, many other forms of life, and and thus uh, bringing up the idea of coexistence. We believe there's a sort of an ethical a duty uh, to 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 actively coexist with many other uh, forms of life. And I'll give you some examples of that in, in just a second. But um, so the the vision is is very much one of uh, being immersed in nature. So uh, these this is an image from Singapore. Singapore is one of our first partner cities um, in the network. Of course, a city city and a city state. Um, you may know the history that Singapore has framed itself or described itself historically as a garden city. More recently, it has changed its framing or its motto uh, to city in a garden, which seems like a small change, but it's really uh, quite profound. Uh, and even more recently, and partly in response to what happened during uh, the pandemic, uh, they are calling themselves a city in nature. So this idea that that for a long time we thought cities and nature were sort of polar opposites and you couldn't you know almost by definition uh, nature was somewhere else you had to find it away from you had to leave the city to find it um we're still in a way caught a little bit in in the next phase of that thinking which is that na nature's in the city it's just in certain places and um we we certainly need parks but this vision is very much about going beyond parks and seeing beyond parks. And, and so instead of living, uh, uh, going to visit the park, we see the city as the park or the city as the garden in the case of Singapore or the city, the city um, in, in embedded in nature, ideally. Right. Um, and so the notion that you, you, you have nature all around you and where we've, we've, uh, overcome that that sort of uh, separation between uh, humans and and the natural world. So Singapore, uh, like a lot of our cities, doing some really interesting and innovative things to to 
protect the nature there that they have, but growing it uh, as well. Um, and uh, Singapore is a very, very vertical kind of city. So they have something called the human, the um, landscape replacement policy. So if you build a building like this one, this is the now kind of famous Park Royal uh, Hotel. Uh, you have to replace uh, at least the amount of nature taken up by the uh, consumed by the foot of the footprint of the building uh, that has to be replaced in in the vertical design of the structure. So that means uh, green rooftops and green green walls and <clears throat> and and lots of other kind of uh, ecological and living uh, elements in in the building. So this uh, example, uh, the Park Royal Hotel, it it produces or it in incorporates um, about 200 percent, twi twice the amount of, of nature that's lost at ground level. And that's one of the things that Singapore's sort of been pioneering, the incorporation of vertical nature. So uh, so very much a, a kind of vision of immersive nature. So if I had to, to sort of quickly summarize the key elements, uh, it is uh, imagining future cities where you have you are immersed in nature where that nature is um is integrated and and continuous for some, some reason my my animated slide stopped continuous and seamless it's certainly the built environment but it's the built and natural environments integrated together um it is about biodiversity certainly and about wildness as well um it is it certainly includes parks but it's uh, thinking beyond parks. Um, it's whole of city in the sense that it's those buildings that we talked about or mentioned or showed uh, and in and, and all the biophilic elements at that scale. but but again, it's also the neighborhood and 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 uh, you know city and region and all this all those scales together. It's whole of life. We believe that you ought to have contact and connection with nature from from very a very early age. Um, all the way through adulthood and, and into elderhood, as we might call it. And by the way, this image on the lower right is of a, a school, a really interesting school in Atlanta. And we've done a short film about that. And uh, these are kids that the, the design of the school is actually not a single building, but a series of smaller buildings, uh, smaller classrooms. And the kids come expecting to move around during the day. They bring their coats, they bring their, their, uh, their boots. Uh, there's a forest behind the school where they where they take their assignments. Um, they're also growing some of their own food. Um, they're farm animals. It's sort of a work kind of an urban farm uh, as well. So quite an interesting um, uh, project or, or school. Um, it's a culture of biophilia also, we should say. So it's not just the presence or absence of nature that defines a biophilic city. Uh, it, it, it's how humans connect or relate to that nature. How much do we care about that nature? Are we able to identify common species of flora and fauna? Are we uh, engaged in the restoration uh, or care of that 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 nature? And then uh, finally, just just and inclusive. We know in American cities, especially um, there has historically is a an unfair and unequal distribution of nature, largely following historic uh, practices like redlining. Um, and so, one of the big challenges in a number of cities in our network is is how to um, um, address those those inequalities, the unfairness. If you look at the redlining maps, um, very, very predictive of uh, parks and 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 tree canopy. The the uh, and and so um, a, a fair and just uh, biophilia is a really important part of what we're trying to do um, as well. So we have uh, 30 plus cities now that are official members of the network as partner cities. We call them partner cities. Uh, there's a, a kind of more official uh, process for joining, for applying to be a member. Um, and happy to talk more about that if that's of interest. One of the things that has to happen or we we ask to happen uh, is that there is a city council adopted uh, resolution um, stating the intent to join the network and and to be uh, and to aspire or, or, or work towards becoming a biophilic city. Um, we have several thousand individual members and several hundred organizations as well. And so there's a there's an online pledge and and so it, it's possible just to join as an individual by by going online and signing that 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 pledge. 
Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, um, they joined now two years ago. Usually I show up to and, and to give them a, their uh, membership certificate and to have, we usually organize some form of celebratory um, event. This is a big uh, Earth Day um, event at uh, Dorothea Dix Park in, in Raleigh. So we were quite excited to have uh, Raleigh in the network. By the way, the last few months have been uh, really interesting. We've had five new cities join as partner cities. Kansas City, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Verona, Italy, uh, Izmir, Turkey, and Colombo, Sri Lanka. So we're we're becoming, as we hope, we're trying to become more international in our in our scope. Although, if you look at the if you look at the map on biofluxcities.org, there's, there's certainly a, a, a still a heavy sort of uh, European and North American. Uh, North American focus. So lots of things, different things that our cities are are doing. Um, there is a, a page for each of the partner cities. So if you see something that looks interesting, I'd love for you to take a look. Um, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail um, for any one city, but I, I do have just, again, a little sampling of, of things that, that cities are doing. San Francisco, one of our uh, original partner cities um, and doing kind of creating green elements, green space and spaces for nature um, in small and often leftover pieces or, or parcels in the city. Really interesting work here. You see around this idea of a sidewalk gardening permit or sidewalk landscape permit. Um, Jane Martin, who lives in the Mission District in, in San Francisco, um, helped to advocate for the creation of this, this special permit, which made it easier, makes it easier for residents to take up pavement and to plant gardens. Um, and so there have now been more than 2,000 2, of these uh, that have been uh, issued. Uh, San Francisco, uh, one of our original partner cities has been inspirational in a, in a lot of ways. Um, they, as you may know, first American city to mandate the installation of, of, of green roofs uh, through their better roofs ordinance. And actually what it requires is uh, the installation of either a green roof or a solar roof or a combination of the two. And um, increasingly, it is a creative combination. It's something that's been going by the word biosolar. The, you see one on the left. Uh, in the picture, the, and the evidence, emerging evidence, is that actually the the shade from the PV panels creates a special uh, special habitat that adds niches and um, adds to the biodiversity of the rooftop. And and actually the the green elements, the green roof, uh, helps to cool uh, the PV panels and um, uh, aids and it, it, they become more efficient and their pr production is actually a little bit higher. So it's possible to have the green and the solar uh, together. Um, Pittsburgh is another partner city in our network. A lot of really wonderful things going on uh, there. This is image an image just to sort of make the point that um, part of this is about looking at the city in a different way recognizing that many things that may seem and are human design built elements of the of the city uh, are also places where nature can 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 happen this this bridge uh, could be a nesting site for a peregrine falcon but but in in a city like Pittsburgh a, a, a lot of the elements have to do with the things you see here the connection to rivers to, to water um, they have a, a, a wonderful new large park um, uh, close to downtown and pretty impressive tree canopy at 42 uh, percent. So Pittsburgh um, and and we've just made a little film about a very special uh, history and quality of that of the city, which is the um, uh, network of city stairs or city steps, which are often the best ways to enjoy nature in this city to to find your way into a, a little patch of woods, uh, or to see the city from, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a high uh, a hilltop. Um, this is a network, historically, a, a network of stairs that um, was a major pedestrian 
uh, you know, infrastructure for for workers getting from their their hilltop neighborhoods down down to factories at, on the river. Uh, but it's re a really interesting um, uh, asset, and very un unusual, and uh, um, again, a very important part of how uh, residents of Pittsburgh can get into nature and can en can enjoy nature. So there's a an eight or nine minute film about the city steps. Um, some of it uh, has to do with um, the Allegheny Garden Club that's been become a, a champion of restoring uh, this network of steps. And there is now a, a city steps plan um, that, that's quite, quite good. So every city will ha have its own unique kinds of nature, its own unique nature assets. Um, and this is maybe a good uh, example of that. Um, how do we how we move through a city is is part of the uh, what a biophilic city is the the idea that you uh, will experience nature you know back back to the forest bathing idea of walking through that forest um, and we ought to be able to walk through the forest on the way from your home to work or on the way to the store uh, nature is just again we're immersed in nature so it's an experience we're having uh, all, all the time and every thing that we're doing in that city. Singapore has developed this network of, of park connectors, which is quite impressive. And you see um, actually my favorite segment of it called Southern Ridges, where you're actually walking um, through at sort of canopy tree treetop uh, level and really a, a wonderful way of getting around and getting somewhere, but, but experiencing nature along the way. Um, <clears throat> other Cities have been experimenting with similar things. Um, I have to give a shout out to Arlington. Arlington uh, has been in our network for a little while now, and in many ways uh, has generated some of the most interesting applications. So they, there is a, these images are from um, a, a new um, sector plan, Pentagon City sector plan, which makes biophilia kind of the centerpiece and the, the sort of unifying design idea here is what they're calling the green ribbon. You see a little bit of the rendering of it on the left, but not unlike the Singapore idea, these are uh, tree-lined, natureful uh, pathways and walkways that are meant to connect um, major points in the in the in the city. Um, wildness can we can have a a great conversation about what what it means what um, what is wild, what isn't wild, uh, but wildness is something we we desire in cities. Um, and you'll hear a lot of discussion about rewilding, and that's a big part of what a biophilic city is. A lot of examples of this, um, and here actually is another film. This is a case of a, uh, a, inter, a, a downtown water feature. You see it on the upper right, highly chlorinated, energy intensive, a uh, biologically sterile uh, sort of water feature that had, had that's been converted into essentially a native biodiverse wetland in the sit center of the city. This is Perth, Perth in Western Australia. Uh, we've been in um, discussion with them for a long time, and we have um, uh, one Australian city, their neighbor Fremantle, that's officially a partner city now. But this is a wonderful story, and there's again a short film about it. Or daylighting streams, uh, bringing things out of engineered underground pipes and and making them visible in the community. Uh, this is Victoria Gastez, the capital of the Basque Country uh, in Spain, uh, another one of our partner cities. And this uh, small river on the right uh, was in fact underground. It's now uh, you know been brought back to the surface and and is this wonderful, beautiful water element um, and lots of biodiversity there. So I mentioned uh, the coexistence and making space for other forms of life. And we have some uh, very dramatic examples of that. Um, the smooth coated otters in Singapore, you may know that story. There are now more than 80 of them that have returned. And um, we another short film about them, if you're uh, interested. Part of the story behind uh, how and why they returned is 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 seen on the left, which is the Kalang River, um, and and it's you see it here. It's meandering. It's actually doing what it's supposed to do, which is to absorb a lot of floodwaters. But it used to be, it used to look like this on the upper left. It was essentially a uh, engineered uh, flood control uh, project or or or, or, or um, uh, infrastructure, 
and now, now it is this sort of beautiful meandering biodiverse uh, river. It's the most become the most popular uh, park in the city. And we need to be doing more of that kind of restoration work. And it has has the effect. Um, one thing it does is allow for the return of a lot of biodiversity like these um, smooth coated otters that have, have charmed charmed the city, to be sure. And um, not, not a completely positive story as they sometimes have have uh, e eaten a fish out of pot out of, you know, out of uh, ponds and backyards and have, have done some things that that do require some active um, active coexistence. Another a story that we made a film about is Gotham whale in, in New York City. The, essentially the, the story of the return of, of of whales to the water waters of New York as the as the waters have become cleaner and the Menhaden have returned and and so the the idea of back to the idea of awe, and if you if we can imagine cities where you might get a glimpse of a humpback whale um, or a dolphin, um, and in some cases it might be a glimpse from your balcony window, or or you know uh, you might be, be in a in a very urban place, but there are so, so much marine nature around around many of the cities in our in our network that this is a really important element uh, as well. Um, ecological connectivity is a big deal, big, really important in many of our cities. Edmonton, Canada is a wonderful story of, of uh, all the planning they're doing around ecological connectivity, really interesting. Um, one of the things they have been doing is using circuitscape uh, modeling or circuit theory, this idea that you look at, at the city from the perspective of a bird. Uh, where are the electrical circuit? Where the, where are the blockages? Where where might there be a disconnect in the forest canopy that might create some difficulty for an animal uh, uh, living and moving through um, the city? And one of the things they are famous for now, more than just about any other city that we know about, is the uh, requirement for wildlife passages. Whenever they build any any road or any kind of major infrastructure. Uh, they now are building wildlife passages into them. So there are now more than 35 of them. Um, the one on the images on the left are one of the more recent ones. You can get a sense of what they what they look like. Really interesting that um, they're finding a, a side benefit is the pretty sharp reduction in car wildlife collisions. So, you know, I've mentioned the birds. Um, I just talked about looking at Edmonton, looking at their city through the lens of, of a, of a black-capped chickadee. I love that idea, and I have been writing a lot about uh, what it uh, will take uh, to make uh, cities bird friendly, and um, and and this is the actually the newest book um, from 2020, Bird Friendly City, and uh, we've gotten a fair amount of of uh, uh, media attention around it. Um, it it is is its own subject, and I I can't say very much. Um, right now but happy happy to happy to have a conversation about uh charlottesville making charlottesville bird friendly city as part of being a biophilic city and there are of course many things that we can and must do um we you know 50 percent of the world's bird species are in decline it's really shocking uh and depressing in some ways but it is something we can do do something about actually and um, part of it means uh, bird-friendly design, and and um, you know, putting uh, using windows that birds can see. They don't see windows as a barrier, and they what they see is a reflection of a tree or a or a cloud. Uh, and upwards of a billion birds a year uh, die as a result of hitting glass and hitting building uh, facades just in the U.S. Uh, alone. So. Uh, uh, we are uh, thinking a lot about this here on grounds at UVA and um, a lot of discussion in the, Ar the architect's office and here in the School of Architecture. And so that image I've just um, pulled pulled up is is a, a installation from just a few months ago, uh, a retrofit of our cafe, our fine arts cafe. And what they're what th these workers are doing is applying a uh, a film, uh, well, a series of dots, essentially, um, it, that comes in a series of layers, and it's a product called Feather Friendly. And um, what the evidence shows is that 
uh, birds need, there needs to be a pattern density of about two, two inches by two inches for birds to see that and to avoid hitting that glass. So you can see the, the tree being reflected in, in, the, in, in the window. So we're, we're uh, uh, trying to do this. We're, we're advocating for uh, all buildings uh, on grounds to be bird friendly, certainly all new buildings, but also retrofitting buildings um, as well. Okay, it's, uh, I'm realizing I'm, I've gotten, it's taken me a long time to get to trees. This is going to be my transition from um, birds and biodiversity and biophilia to talking about trees and and um, many of you know I think Doug, Doug Tallamy's work and I'm a big fan and uh, uh, I hadn't really realized I'm a uh, I, I love white oaks but I hadn't quite realized the the extent of the mutualism with birds and blue jays in particular as he as he notes they have evolved beaks to 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 penetrate the husk of of acorns they obviously eat a lot of acorns. And it turns out they 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 uh, bury a lot of uh, acorns. Uh, thus, the the mutualism, the way that that um, that those birds help in expanding, extending the the range of 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 um, and the propagation of of white oaks. So we will not have uh, birds without trees, and uh, and they go together. So for me, trees are really important and. Um, I, I sometimes like to show this image of the house that I grew up in in uh, Alexandria. And there's there's me. I did a lot of things. I uh, col you know, collected snakes. You see me with a snake there. I don't know. It must have been about 14 or 15 then. And turtles and uh, uh, watched birds and listened to birds and had had multiple tree houses. Uh, I very much lived uh, uh, in a forest in, in the middle of a city. Um, and it, it was, uh, an early education in, uh, learning to love trees and, and learning, uh, how and why they are so important to us. And so, uh, we, uh, never had air conditioning in this, in this home. We had windows that opened and every spring we got out the, the screens, um, uh, but we were cooled, you know, by the shade and by the evapotranspiration, and it was essentially living in a in a forest. So we've got to, as we um, look down the road, we're having to think more about climate change. And uh, now that we, we've had our 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 hottest summer on on record, right, the hottest summer in 120,000 years or something. So um lots of things that we we can do uh, to address urban heat but the most effective thing is uh is trees investing in trees uh and 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 a, a healthy tree canopy and for me that means uh the first task is protecting the existing older trees that we have the whole view has changed of course we know now that uh um the the most carbon will be sequestered in those older trees. They continue to grow. Uh, they continue to provide immense amounts of, of habitat for, for birds and other critters and they you know, retain storm water and they provide all these amazing mental health benefits that we've already talked about. So we're not paying enough attention to these trees, these, these, these wonderful trees around us. So this is, I went searching in Atlanta uh, last spring for what I, what I thought, what I determined was the, was the oldest and largest tree in the city. And I found it um, as this cherry bark oak. And I show it in part because it, it's a, a wonderful demonstration of the, the cooling uh, value. When you look at the shade, that person is walking, crossing the street entirely in the shade of this, this tree. And it extends well beyond the other side of of the street, so uh, it it's hard to overstate the value. It's also hard to overstate the importance of trees, just in terms of the the quality of our lives. Definitely, but the, I'm sometimes talking about this in terms of quality of place. What would what would what would our city be like without trees? Uh, would the character of a community be like without trees? So I just showed a picture of Atlanta. They see, they still call themselves a city and a forest. Uh, Raleigh, I mentioned, is now in our network. Well, they're uh, they call themselves a city of oaks, and those oak trees go back to the to the genesis of the, of the city itself, the forming of the city, the laying out of the town, uh, and and the creation of these uh, squares that are still uh, uh, forested. So. It's hard to over 
state the importance of of trees in our in our cities. And of course, there's a huge equity dimension to this. I've already mentioned it. Um, a number of our our partner cities, Richmond, and and here you see Pittsburgh on the right. Uh, their Shade Commission just uh, uh, not long ago issuing a, an equitable street tree investment uh, strategy. Um, Richmond setting minimum targets actually for um, for tree canopy, both both citywide, but then uh, minimum for for each neighborhood, and and actually focusing on uh, those underserved neighborhoods, largely African American neighborhoods, where because of redlining and long long standing discrimination, spatial segregation, that the tree canopy is 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 already much lower. So their uh, Richmond 300 plan uh, is, I think, quite quite exemplary in that uh, incorporating um, those sort of equity targets uh, having to do with trees and 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 canopy. Um, but it, you know, I, we do have a problem here, and uh, I, I think this is probably where we should have uh, some discussion and make make time for discussion. I have uh, a, a terrible collection. Of photographs of trees um, that have been large trees that have been cut down. I live in Greenbrier, Greenbrier neighborhood. The image on the left is uh, uh, Dairy Road, uh, which is my my the way I walk to UVA every day. And uh, it was pretty shocking to me that in the in the um, renovation of this house, one of the things they did was to was to cut down the thing that made the lot in the house most distinctive, which was this this beautiful old tree. And then they uh, pretty quickly installed the air conditioning units that will uh, have to work to, to, to compensate for the, for the natural cooling that that tree would have, would have uh, provided. And so it does seem to me that um, we do, the trees don't seem to matter, especially the existing older trees. Most of, you know, I think about Azalea Springs, um, the city gave the developer a waiver to their critical slopes permit or, or ordinance, and um, very few trees that, at least in the original design, uh, would have been protected. And so I, I know there's a tree code under development. Um, I think we, we can learn from looking at other cities. Uh, for me, part of this uh, is about tree psychology. And so I started working on this little graphic last week. Or two weeks ago, I, I was asked to to give a presentation at a psychology department, uh, brown bag, and I don't know much about psychology, but it's but everything I was seeing about trees, um, led me to believe that it was that there were it was all about psychology that that homeowner, um, decided to cut down that tree, in in part, um, be, because. Uh, the, well, for lots of reasons, there there were no penalties. There were no uh, neighbors expressing um, uh, dissatisfaction. Uh, the perception of trees is that they are essentially private property, and the cutting down of even a very large tree is a is a is an individual homeowner decision. One doesn't need to think about the larger public. Um, I think that's wrong, but that is, I think, the psychology. Uh, that's often at play, and it seems like these decisions are made uh, casually, callously, uh, with very, very little in the way of uh, clear um, purpose or reason. Or often, often we seem to think about trees in the same way that we do street furniture or something, something else, changing the color of the paint uh on our house at house um i see it quite differently and so i'm trying to understand what the possible causal uh influences might be the the kind of uh le points of leverage um uh, where where this where we might change the psychology so for example i'm i'm now having conversations with my neighbors about their trees um and as aldo leopold understood that if you if you wanted farmers to conserve soil, they the one of the most effective ways is is to create um, a, a feeling that your neighbors were were watching what you're doing and would disapprove of practices that would cause a soil erosion. So I'm actively engaging my my neighbor across the street in uh, in a conversation about how beautiful uh, her her trees are. Um, if your neighbor doesn't know that, they may not 
care or take into account uh, what you what you think or what the neighborhood uh, thinks, even though it's a very civic or collectively collective impact collectively impacted impacting decision. Um, uh, we need to create incentives. We need to, uh, and of course, we need stronger uh, codes. But I do believe it takes a wooded uh, village, and that's one of the things. Even when you have a strong pre-code, the enforcement of that code requires active neighbors and and folks who express outrage, who who call, who report, who advocate, who show up at council meetings. Uh, really, really important. So, um, just in the time that we have, we're coming up on an hour. I know. Uh, I'll just quickly go through, I mean, there's so many uh, examples of what cities are doing, some of them not in, yet in our network. Uh, we've been spending time in, in Seattle. We have a series of short films. If we have time to show one in a second, um, uh, I think that would be great. But Seattle uh, has in, is in a really interesting period of transition. They had a, a, a tree code that essentially protected so-called exceptional trees. These are trees that were uh, 30 inches or greater dbh uh, like the one you see here and permits were only issued if a tree was dead uh, or a hazard or if a developer uh, landowner developer was not able to build on that lot uh, you, you had to actually go through the steps of altering um, your project moving it to the side uh, making it more vertical uh, all the flexibility given by the city to 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 let you build, but also protect that tree, and only if, only if you could show there was no other way to build, um, would you be given would you be granted a permit? Um, the law has recently changed, and it's now become a little easier for developers to cut down trees, and that's too bad. Uh, it has uh, activated a lot of citizens uh, who show up and who are uh, like the group on the right. There's a, a community group called the Last 6,000 Campaign, which is refers to the last 6,000 old growth trees in the city of, of, of Seattle, and also uh, uh, Tree Action Seattle and other organizations. And it's a longer story than I have time to tell here, and we're making a film about this, but this is a tree called Luma, Western Red Cedar, uh, that was threatened with being cut by a developer um, developer wanted to build six units on what was a one unit residential lot. Um, and it, and anyway, it, 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 they held a, um, what, what, what the activists in Seattle call a gratitude gathering, which was a sort of a saying goodbye to the tree. And one thing led to another and they basically decided to do some direct action, got a lot of media attention. Um, and the developer basically was kind of shamed into, into scaling back the project slightly, although it was pretty clear that he could have built all six units, but it, he, he reduced it by one unit uh, and saved the tree. Um, but a lot of other trees are, are being lost. So um, this is the, the short film I wanted to show you. One of the big debates going on in Seattle and many other cities, is it, is it possible to protect the existing larger trees in a community, but also allow uh, growth, also allow uh, housing. And the, Seattle, like Charlottesville, is worried about affordable housing, needs more housing. Is it possible to design that housing in ways that protect trees? And um, I, most of us on the tree protection, tree conservation side say it, it is possible. And we have uh, examples of how, to, of how to do that. So this is a short film about this project called Bryant uh, Heights uh, that has uh, made several large trees, uh, um, including the Douglas fir that you see here, uh, a centerpiece of the courtyard around which the homes are clustered. And then you see a grove of trees on the right that is actually protected by setting back the, the homes. Um, and it's pretty dense and compact, uh, certainly would be considered so for Charlottesville and a wonderful example. So um, at this point, um, Tom and James, I think I'm, I'm going a little bit long. There's a lot more information on the slides. I'll just quickly go to the end. If you uh, would like to see more information, it's a, a case of, of um, City of Toronto actually buying a tree. Uh, what happens if, we, if, if, a, if a homeowner, a, a landowner, a developer, 
uh, can't do anything on their land because of a strong tree code. Um, well, in the case of, of Toronto, they actually purchased this home and lot and will be making a park out of it. And uh, it's it's a, it's the largest tree, certainly the largest northern oak in the city. That's one option. Um, we also have the ability to use TDR, transfer of development rights. And so this these are um, images from Portland. Portland has a tree uh, preservation TDR uh, pr provision. So if you cannot uh, build or you can't fully uh, build to the density permitted on your lot because you're being asked to protect a tree or a grove of trees, you can then transfer that density. You can either sell it to, to a developer who then can use it in a receiving zone uh, to increase their density, or you can actually use it yourself on an adjacent lot or somewhere else. So we have the ability to create mechanisms uh, that will protect trees, even in cases uh, where where building becomes difficulty d difficult. So a lot of uh, things I don't have time to talk about, about how we cultivate connections to trees. A big part of the story, I think, is how we develop a love of trees, uh, a caring for trees. We layer the stories about trees. This is Canopy Story, a really interesting um, initiative at uh, cr created by a couple of Portland State professors to to capture the the personal stories about, about trees. I think there's so many ways that we could... Um, connect people to trees. Um, and I don't have time to tell you about the UVA Decarbonization Academy, but maybe maybe a little, little bit later. I have an exercise in my spring class that in, involves students going out and identifying their favorite tree on grounds and then writing about it, writing poetry, uh, drawing it, connect, uh, developing connections. I had a, a little bit of uh, some images about trends that I wanted to, to talk about. I know you've heard about the Milwaukee Method um, so we're making a film actually about this guy and the Netherlands. They have 200 uh, tiny forests, um, Milwaukee method forests, are replacing parking lots by planting them. Uh, a lot of interest uh, in planting now around this idea of a transgressive forest. So instead of just planting trees in a uh, street trees in a row, uh, we begin to kind of really re reimagine the urban environment. I'm happy to talk to you more about that. We've gotten to know Mariel Anzalone in New York who. Uh, has this concept of of the biome block. So instead of a, a street tree, we think of an entire uh, a forest ecosystem and uh, and reimagining landscapes uh, in cities, forested landscapes that incorporate room uh, for dead and dying trees and and nurse logs. And we have a campus campus of uh, University of Oregon where they're incorporating that into their design. Um, and uh, you know, I'm a big owl fan, so, uh, we've got to make room for snags. So maybe the last place to stop or the place to stop for now and maybe try to show the film is just to make the point that I, I do believe uh, we need a different ethic. We need a different set of, we need to cultivate a different set of values about how we look at trees so that uh, we shift away from just seeing that tree uh, uh, primarily as as private property, as an individual decision we understand, uh, begin to understand that cutting down that tree uh, has implications. And and we need uh, taxation and other, we need the property tax system, for example, to acknowledge that that tree, uh, that saving that tree, refraining from cutting that, down that tree delivers a public benefit that should be rewarded uh, financially. So we need a whole different incentive structure. This is an um, excerpt from Margaret Rin Rinkle's column, um, in the New York Times, stop thinking of trees as objects that belong to us and come to understand them as long-lived ecosystems temporarily under our protection. I love the the idea. And for me, um, build, building in and connecting with the deeper history, deeper uh, ethic uh, uh, of Native Americans and indigenous culture, uh, very fond uh, of uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, and, and her idea of standing trees and forests as standing people. Uh, we move from seeing trees and forests as a commodity to seeing them as kin. And uh, and that certainly is what, what is underpinning a lot of the move in the direction towards uh, the rights of nature, giving person legal personhood to, to trees and forests. So um, there's a little bit more. I'll let you maybe scroll through 
um, the rest of the slides and Tom and James, I'm happy to, to provide them or let you have them and put them somewhere if you'd like. There, it's a, there are lots of books and resources if you're interested in there. And there is the um, website for the, for the network. Um, I hope you're all still there. Uh, how, how do we feel about seeing seeing this little film? I've lost a few of you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, let's see if I can do it. Uh, I have to find it. And um, well, let's see. I think. Oh, no, here it is. Here is the, no, it's not. For some reason, all my, my uh, email went away. So I'm going to have to get back into Maybe you all can have too many screens open. It's hard to share. Yeah, I I wonder if it did that automatically for me. Um, let's see. I uh, pinned it, so let's see where it is. Yeah, here it is. Um, you know, actually, I'm going to stop sharing and share again because I have to check those boxes. Okay, can you see the screen? Yep. Are you, are you seeing that? Does it look good? Looks good. Okay. This is Bryant Heights. Uh, it's a mixed use development finished in 2018. It's a mix of commercial, multifamily, and single family. This was a former child welfare campus. There were a number of buildings here on the site from the 70s, a classroom building, a dormitory building, also some parking lots, and then a number of large trees and nice lawn. And the surrounding neighbors really had treated this site as an ad hoc park for a number of years. So they were very connected to it. Uh, and the developer knew that. And so as a way to work with the neighborhood and be on the same team with the neighborhood, um, they decided they were gonna try really hard to keep as many of the intact canopies and larger trees as possible. Especially in the city of Seattle, we have a housing crisis here. There is an emphasis on building as much as possible, building as many units as possible. And so often the trees are uh, a secondary concern. Uh, so many developers will decide to, for instance, pay a fee um, and cut down the tree rather than trying to design around the existing tree because you know it's maybe easier to uh, clear cut the site and then maximize the footprint of the building and then maximize the number of units. This project was unique uh, because the developer realized early on that these trees are amazing and they're an asset to the project. And we know, um, based on research, that big trees are good for a number of reasons. They clean the air. Um, if you have a canopy that's relatively dense, you can drop the temperature of the surrounding area by, I think, up to 14 degrees, something like that. And we also have a heat island problem here. So it's a few degrees warmer in the city of Seattle generally than it is in the surrounding areas because we don't have as much tree canopy. So anywhere that we can preserve the tree canopy, um, that's a benefit to the people who are living around those trees because it'll be cooler. So the site plan is a U shape. Um, and, and one of the main reasons is that these trees are, are so important. Uh, they've been here for over a hundred years and we wanted to make sure we were working around them. In some cases here, the proposed buildings were gonna get a little closer to the trees than would be prescribed in the code. But we were able to argue that the root balls 
had actually grown asymmetrically and we were we were organizing the site around those existing foundations so that we weren't cutting the roots anywhere we were actually just building on existing foundations and allowing the tree to remain as is in its kind of asymmetrical root condition as you know with developers it really comes down to uh, the bottom line um, and making the pro forma work and in this case it did the trees ended up being an asset i i think that these houses uh sold for much more than they would have if the if the landscape hadn't been so uh well designed it was really a a benefit to the project so you're saying that the under the code there there is a status given to a, a grove versus a, a single tree that's correct if there's a consistent canopy, it counts as a grove, and that is another protected class. Is it a, a higher level of protection? It's about the same as an exceptional tree. Okay. So, so you, you might have a grove them. of trees that individually each tree would not be that's uh, right. protected, but together they, they, they have a protective. That's right. And we also feel like we have a moral obligation to preserve them, um, especially with the pressure of development happening in the city right now. We know we're losing tree canopy. And when we have opportunities like this, we feel like it's very important to have the conversation early on with the developer and arborist and the city and make sure that we are we're preserving those special trees and groves. When you preserve large native trees like the hemlock grove down there, uh, you also make the environment more uh, friendly to other native plants like in this case Oregon grape and salal. And if you have other native plants, you start to create a more native ecosystem, which then attracts native birds. Is this owned uh, jointly by, by the residents? How, and how is it maintained? The residents actually each have their own front yard that they can do with what they want. But uh, there, I think there's an understanding amongst all of the owners that this should feel continuous and feel like one ecosystem. And so they work together. So we brought an alley through the middle so that cars could access garages from the inside of the site and thereby preserving the larger trees on the exterior of the site. Normally, for houses like this, you might have garages or at least driveways that would come off the main road on either side, but that would have required cutting down more trees. And the, the easiest uh, path is to just um, pay a fee and be able to cut down the tree and maybe plant some smaller trees elsewhere. Uh, I think the fear in the city and the um, criticism of the new tree ordinance is that it, it makes it too easy to just pay the fee. So you don't have to take the steps to work with the city to exhaust all of these options before going to the, the fee payment option. We worked on a project about a mile away that had a very large elm tree existing and a developer wanted to build a, a five-story multifamily building on the site. The tree was right in the middle. Uh, it would have been relatively easy for that developer to cut down that tree and maximize the footprint on the site. Instead, he went to the city and proposed uh, that he be able to build an extra story on his development and then build around the tree and preserve the tree and the city agreed and so that was an incentive that he received for saving that tree and today the tree is thriving uh, and so is the community around it. We have a housing crisis in the city a lot of people are very focused on that but we also have a climate crisis and the truth is we don't need to focus on one or the other. We can have trees and houses. We just need to be a little more creative about how we do that. Okay. All right. First first people who have ever have seen this film. Really? Yeah. Wow.
<laughs> thanks for the owner too yeah i just i i work with this editor and uh who's based in colorado and he we go back and forth and he sends me things and uh but no, but yeah we haven't posted it yet so well, we, we, we need to get our at university of washington in seattle yeah. and so yeah. we, we know about uh okay. shortages of housing and and so on and so on yeah yeah, it just hurt, hurts me to watch that, though, when I think about Charlottesville and what they're doing right now, because I um, maybe I'll jump in with kind of a first question. You yeah. you have a number of cities that have signed on to be biophilic cities. I mean, is it is it kind of a one champion or or how is it that some communities have actually stepped up to do this? Because I we have I mean, I know in Charlottesville we have a tree commission in the right. One of our uh, frequent visitors or attendees to these, she's not here tonight. Um, uh, Jean Umaker. Uh, yeah, boy, you know they're very interested in this, and yet it doesn't seem to quite get the traction in Charlottesville that apparently it has in other communities. What's the what's the secret elsewhere? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it's interesting. The the Seattle, I, we're working on several different films about Seattle and and one about the Luma, the case that I mentioned, and the tree activism. And uh, if you talk to the tree activists, they're very unhappy and the code has been changed. And how could this happen in Seattle of all places where trees are so important? And so the impression you'd get there, I think right now, is that things aren't going so well. Seattle's not actually in our network, but but uh, and they've done a lot of wonderful things and a lot of very progressive policies over the years. Uh, but there's you know the possibility of backsliding and and you know and as as they are on trees, I think right now. So it's no no place has has fully you know uh, fi completely figured it out, and there are fits and starts and and st you know positive steps but then you know other other disappointments uh but you're right it does it does take champions um and then every one of our cities uh the the process of getting that city to join the network uh took took volunteers or took took champions and and um so for example in 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 washington dc washington's in the network it took a a small group of a uh, little army of of local citizens who who got, who got together basically to lobby uh city you know all the city council members one one at a time um to educate them about this and to advocate for for joining and and that's kind of how it happened um i'm i would hope that it wouldn't take quite 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 so much of an army in charlottesville but it but it 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 could yeah has there been any effort to actually try to do this, Tim, or is that still waiting to happen? Um, join the network? Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, n n nothing very tangible, not, ne nothing to the extent of having, uh, of develop, beginning to develop the application or, I mean, we've had various conversations uh, with, with folks. One of the last, um, I gave a presentation actually to the Tree Commission um maybe six months ago and and crystal ritter rittervold was was also presenting that night and crystal crystal and i have had several conversations over the years about getting charlottesville to join and for whatever reason it just it just has never happened and mm -hmm. um um so i you know i, I, I the answer is basically no i mean i think i think it it wouldn't take much but it would take someone with the city i mean it would take um expression of interest and the ability the willingness or the uh ability to prepare the application and submit it and and you know do all of that and and so we're we're kind of funny in a funny position Th this is not a we're not a, a green certification body we're not certifying that charlottesville is a, a biophilic city or pittsburgh or any city um and it's it's very much an aspirational network so we 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 don't want you to join if you don't see the value in joining yeah. in a way you know it's it's aspirational we're not going to twist your arm right um yeah i was just i was astonished by how far flung this group is that you have and i mean you have you know cities around the world yeah and, and so and they've all decided to jump 
And I guess I'm curious, are there one or two or three factors in the sort of circumstance of a city that you think make them decide they want to do this? Yeah. Um, well, it, it's usually, um, sometimes it's a focusing event. It, it might be um, Fremantle, Western Australia. They, they went through uh, a, a process actually of a highway that, that um, was about to, to knock down on a, ancient Banksia forest um, and in combination with local advocates and uh, work being done at one of the local universities, it, 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 it sometimes develops from, from personal relationships that we, be, we begin to have with staff in these, in these cities. Um, Pittsburgh, uh, it, it was the Phipps conservatory. Um, and um, it's often somebody like that, a kind of anchor institution that then becomes then helps to kind of propel propel it forward. I think that's probably a good a good model. So Phipps began of you know a botanical garden or a you know you kind of almost by definition is interested in these things, and they started organizing monthly biophilia uh, events. And um, I came a couple of to a couple of different ones and gave talks and uh one thing led to another and they we started having conversations with the city and just having having the embrace of of this Phipps conservatory was really really powerful and um so it's it's different and in each place is a little bit different but there there is this uh sense of seeing the value in being part of a network i mean there are a lot of city networks there's ICLEI and you know, bigger cities have have a lot a lot of you know, um, right. a lot of yeah. big bigger networks. But th this is a sort of a a very specialized kind of network um, focused on nature. And so I think that that the cities that end up joining recognize that there's this is something that that that's different and it adds something, it adds value and and they see the benefit in it. So. Well, thank you. That's helpful. So, and there are a lot of things I, I didn't tell, really tell you much about what the network does, but we have we have monthly partner calls, um, usually with a presentation from someone from um, one of the cities. Um, we do we have a webinar actually tomorrow about dark sky, uh, for example. We don't we do webinars also. Uh, we pu publish an online journal called Biophilic Cities. We make these films. There, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of ways that being in the network you know would benefit you as a city if you're interested in in nature that's good that's good yeah Thank you. we've got a question peter. from uh, peter gates who's uh been listening this evening peter go ahead i'm actually just basically uh, drawing attention to a question that i think is really interesting that was posed by uh, pat calvert of uh vcn and um I'm sorry. I'm just looking at the chat box. Sorry. If, if yeah, you can read his question. I didn't. <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to speak for Pat, but I thought it was really interesting in the sense that. Okay. I mean, Los Angeles is a member of this aspirational network, and it kind of makes me think of Charlottesville, not in terms of the scale, but in terms of the fact that Charlottesville is, you know, close to the Blue Ridge. Yeah. And close to, uh, you know, the Southwest Mountains. Right which Los Angeles obviously is close to, but several mountain ranges. Um, yeah. So yeah, you can read Pat's question. I think it's a very appropriate one. Yeah, yeah. So there's a reference to the the Wildlife Corridor Action Plan. Um, and and yeah, I mean, we have a lot of, uh, I mentioned, you know, uh, Edmonton, Canada, and all the, all the sort of ecological connectivity stuff that they're doing and wildlife passages and so on. And then, and then of course, yes, Los Angeles, um, our new our newest member and and all the work around their really innovative wildlife ordinance um and uh you know coexisting with mountain lions and i mean there are lots of lessons to be learned from their from their work so but yeah there probably are prospective local community projects probably there you know lots of things going on around here definitely Okay. Um, Dylan, a uh, question about the Dylan, Dylan's, Dylan, Dylan, Dylan's rule. Uh, replace or remove trees. Virginia Homeowners Association has killed attempts for years to allow localities this this authority. Yeah, and we we've looked at at 
you know, Norfolk has a, a relatively new tree ordinance um, that might be a model. Um, and they do, I mean, they, they have gotten permission to do this basically. I mean, they, they, uh, develop, you have to submit a tree protection plan and you have to indicate which trees are, are, are going to be cut, which trees are going to be planted. How are you going to reach the minimum, uh, tree canopy uh, mandated? It's not very ambitious. It's, you know, 10% or 15% or 20, depending on the zoning, uh, district you're in um the zone you're in uh, but you i mean cities are doing things like that in virginia hey any other quick questions i only say quick because at the uh, time i know yeah, we're at I, the time I'm a little bit late sorry about that no it's, i think there was a dedicated crew here stuck with it and listened um quite a yes bit. you Is did anybody, does anybody <laughs> i've worn you I, out and you you have uh, stayed stayed with it yeah, sincere interest. Any does anybody uh, have well, a I yeah, just, Christine? Christine, I just want to say so happy to hear you talk about bird friendly cities and to hear the action that's being taken to protect the birds from the glass. And yeah. and to hear that that's happening at UVA. And but there are also some things at UVA like the tennis, the lights at the tennis courts. Yeah. Like why can't we get some traction there? Um, mm-hmm. In terms of uh, reducing light pollution, but yeah. you know, maybe there's some opportunity if Charlottesville would become a biophilic city to really think about in a yeah. holistic manner how do we address light pollution, right. be all these things yeah. are really important. Yeah, so much. It was really a great talk. I really appreciate. Oh, it. Yeah, yeah. Light lights, light pollution is a huge, huge uh, issue yeah. for us in the network. And let me know how I can how I can help with any any of this going forward. And if you all want to be the catalyst for for advocating for getting the city in the network, we'd love we'd love for you to. Right. Um, we we can just again only do so much advocating ourselves, and we can yeah. But yeah. happy to happy to if if it made sense to have a meeting or something or organize um, a a group that could discuss that possibility. You know that that would be a maybe a next step. Yeah, I don't know, Tim, just before we close out here, I mean, to what extent have you had any uh, conversations with uh, members of the city's tree commission? Because I know there are, I mean, there is a group yeah. of individuals that uh, like your video from Seattle, they appreciate the need for more affordable yeah. housing in our community, but, but yeah. they're really concerned about the tree canopy. Sincerely. Yeah. Well, we've had a lot of discussions with the. I mean, I, I I think the tree the tree commission would be a good uh, group to advocate for this. Uh, Peggy Vanieres and um, Jeff Jeff Eaton Eaton uh, are both people I know very well. Uh, actually, J D Brown, our biophilic cities program director, I've mentioned him a couple of times just now. He's now on the commission. So, <laughs> um. Maybe that's a conflict of interest. I don't know, but he's but we've so we got a lot of built-in support there, and that's a good idea. Maybe that that's what we the the I I would I would see that as a cornerstone cornerstone partner in any I, effort here in yeah. Charlottesville. I you know you were showing that picture in Green uh, your neighborhood, and I live down the Rugby Avenue arena, and I almost tears in my eyes. One of my neighbors took down a huge huge tree. Yeah. late this summer I, I can't even imagine 150 200 years old and yeah look completely healthy and they say well it's so big we're afraid it might fall on our house yeah that's so, often the answer that you get uh oh. something like that uh yeah it is it's just a heart heart heartbreaking so so well, you're right yeah we should probably draw this to a close uh just because of time and uh, i think everyone would Raise their hands and uh, appreciation. <laughs> well, thank tonight. you for all you're doing. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Tim. Okay. We'll get this recording out and others will uh, be able to to listen and enjoy and learn. So thank you very much for good. your time tonight. Happy to do it. Yeah. Thank you, Take, Tim. Take care. Yeah. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.